This is the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, episode number 107. As marketing communication and technical communication slowly begin to converge around omnichannel distribution strategies, content professionals need to stay on their toes. Both the details of the work and the ways that employers seek out content talent are changing. Jack Molasani can help you navigate this new terrain. He runs both a content staffing agency and Lavacon, a big content strategy and technical communication conference. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 107 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I'm really happy today to welcome back Jack Molisani. Uh, Jack, um, you may know he does a lot of stuff. He's the He runs a ProSpring Technical Staffing, uh, an agency that focuses on content professionals. He also uh, organizes the LavaCon Conference, which is, well, tell us more about LavaCon, Jack, because that's coming up pretty quick. And you've been doing it how long now? This is our 19th annual conference, so we've survived a dot-com crash, two recessions, and a pandemic. Yeah, way to keep it going. That's that's amazing. Um, and uh, and I just want to observe, uh, just for the folks who are listening, that I put on a Hawaiian shirt for this because the name LavaCon comes from... Well, tell the origin story real quick. Uh, the conference started in Hawaii. Um, back when there was STC Region 7 and 8, we had a combined conference in Hawaii in the year 2000, and everyone kept saying, I can't wait till next year. And I'm going, there is no next year. Hmm, maybe there's an opportunity here. And, um, but what's my niche, right? There's the STC conference, there was Win Writers at the time. I said, you know, there's not enough conferences with us with a little gray in our temples. So I did the, a content strategy conference and content um, documentation management. And that worked, and we had it in Hawaii. That's why it's called LavaCon. And that worked until the market crashed in 2008. Um, after that, I brought the conference to mainland U.S. cities, but I wanted to keep that Aloha spirit that we were known for, the local music, the local foods. And so we go to New Orleans and Portland and really fun, fun places. Nice. I can't wait till we're doing that in person again. But hey, Jack, the reason I wanted to have you on today, you, you know, you, you're an industry insider, you run a staffing agency. Um, and one thing we talked about a little while back was this, you're, you've identified a convergence of Marcom folks and Techcom folks. And um, I don't want to say, tell, tell us, tell us a little bit about that. I'm super curious about how those uh, fields are converging. Sure. For so long, we have what we called content silos, like uh, grain silos, where marketing had their content, tech support had their content, technical writers had their content, training had their content, and so on. And savvy customers started looking up user documentation before buying a product, right? And I've done that recently myself. I was looking for a home security system, so I downloaded the user manual to see how hard or easy it would be to use that product. Then as marketing became more specialized and automated, um, I'll give you an example. Um, One of the cell phone carriers, when you log into their website, say to replace your phone battery, it knows who you are. So it sends an interrupt over to the marketing machine, which either displays on the same page going, hey, here's a coupon to upgrade to the next phone or sends you an email saying, hey, I see you were looking for a new battery. Here's a coupon for a new phone. So now they're using that content as a business asset and then as a re- um, revenue growth platform, not just something that has to be there like bubble wrap in a user manual. Sorry, you're getting into one of my favorite buzzwords now, which is uh, omnichannel delivery. You know, that that's that's the strategy, I think, that stitches that kind of thing together. Like, OK, we're talking to them here. Um, we're going to help them in this channel, but we also have some other relevant information for them. Um, is that tell me more about the how much do you know about the technology and the, and the business practices that stitch all that together that make that experience you just described possible? Sure. For those of you who have not heard the term omni-channel, take a company like Cisco Systems that has hundreds of products, each of which needs an ingredient, 
uh, list, a, uh, a user guide, a, a promotional video, a web support page, and multiply that by the 27 languages they translate into worldwide, it would be absolutely impossible to keep all that content around in Microsoft Word. So some clever person will take all that content and put it into a database and you can spit out where you want, when you want, on the device that you want, in the language that you want. The person who does that is a content strategist. So an interesting side effect of database publishing is that in traditional publishing, like in Word, you format as you go. You type something in H1, it's this big and you indent that much. Well, in database publishing, um, the content is formatted when it's output, not when it's input. So if I'm looking at, you say, your document on a computer screen, I may get four columns of text. On a laptop, I may get three columns of text. On a tablet, two columns of text. And if I'm looking at a phone, one column of text. So it's responsive design. It knows something about you, the audience, and can format it appropriately. And what's cool about that is you'll never be thrown off by the next big thing, right? It used to be um, iWatches are coming. Oh, the sky's falling. We need to do micro chunking for cell phones. What if we print this on a jumbotron? Well, we can format it for that too. So we've, we've disassociated the formatting from the, the content delivery uh, design itself. Yeah, I think that's, I've had a lot of guests, we've talked about this before, and I've had other guests talk about, like, that's just the future. That's the the increasing decoupling of content from its presentation. Just just going to just gonna keep going. Um, well, t- tell me, just, I want to circle back, you know, to the, um, that convergence of market, Marcom and Techcom stuff. Tell me about, like, how does that manifest for the individual, like, I, maybe if you could talk about both scenarios, like what does that imply for the practice of the technical communication person who's migrating more towards needing to understand the marketing world and vice versa, the Marcom person migrating more or needing to understand the tech com world? How do you, how do you, how would you advise somebody to prepare for that? Yeah. The analogy I like to use is the United Nations of content where you get a representative from every organization or division at the same table at the same time with equal footing, right? So you have marketing, but you also have tech com and training and onboarding and policies and procedures. And you decide on a common terminology, a common vocabulary, a common word set, a common platform. Now, a lot of times, IT is never going to give up their platform. Marketing is not going to give up their platform. But there are tools now that will pull content out of each individual platform and share it, right, regardless of where it's stored. Mm -hmm. So now you can implement a unified content strategy across these silos without actually having to dig down and find out what database are they actually using, right? Another thing I tell people is so often the technical writer is the only person who sees every single piece of a system or a company, right? Because one set of coders will be coding this and another set of coders will be coding that. And they're not even calling the same thing at the same time. And here's my classic example of that. So one year from my conference, one of our LCD projectors died. So I went to Best Buy to buy a new one. And I used my Capital One credit card, but it was an unusual purpose in a city I've never been in, and they declined the purchase, right? So now I just tell them I'm traveling, so they'll know where I'll be so I can use my credit cards. And the problem is, if you go to their website, the option to do that is called specify travel dates. If you call their 800 number, the option is called fraud management. Now, first of all, I want to prevent fraud, not manage it. (laughs) <laughs> um, but two, they're not even calling the same thing in the same company, regardless of company to company, company. So clearly the phone tree people and the website people aren't talking to each other, which is an example why you need to have a chief content officer, a chief content strategist who has interaction with all these departmentals and getting everybody on the same page. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One, it seems like there's another opportunity, like kind of intermediate between 
like the individual practitioners that, that we, we all know and that executive level, like, and this maybe is at the strategy level, like you were saying that like how to pull that together, like, because the tech com person, as much as they get around, you know, the, get their head around marketing, they're still basically, you know, focused on, on that job and, and likewise with the marketing folks. And so do you have a feel for like, um, that intermediate level, and you, you just kind of described it, like, who's the person plucking the stuff from those different silos and making sure that there's a, a, a unified experience for the end user? What's interesting is that since marketing is perceived to generate revenue, it's marketing, right? That's where sales comes from. They'll go, oh, let's give money to the marketing people. Whereas for a long time now, tech writers were seen as a cost center, we have to have a user manual. We have to have online help. Let's let's get, do the very minimum we can do to get away with it. But it's now they're saying, no, we are part of the product development. We are part of the user interface, right? We are now writing UX writing, which is in the user uh, interface and user experience. We're part of the customer journey. Um, so as clear as that may be to you and I, um, that may not be clear to somebody in upper management. So whose job is it to let upper management know the value we bring? Uh, that would be us. But so many con professionals are introverts, right? And they don't want to bang their own drum or they've been taught not to or they don't have the self-confidence. So the first thing I tell people is to take a class in improv comedy. Nice. You, know, <laughs> you will learn to be in the moment. You'll be able to handle any question thrown at you that you weren't expecting and if you can make a room of 125 people laugh, I can do a presentation to a CEO. Um, and you start learning those soft skills that you need to promote what you can do to management. Another one of my favorite stories that I said in almost every interview is it's our job to seize the opportunity, not to wait for someone to give it to us. And my favorite line is the seagulls from the movie Finding Nemo. So when they see food, they go, mine, 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 mine. So when there's an opportunity, a content opportunity, you go, wait a minute, I'm the content professional. We should be doing that. Mine, 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 mine. And then you step in and you take control or ask to take control as the case may be, instead of letting that opportunity kind of just float by. I love that. I'm not sure that I want to be the person to sell that persona to us as a discipline, but I love it. In fact, there's a leftover container in our refrigerator right now that says mine, 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 mine. And I know it's a Finding Nemo fan that did that. So, um, um, but that's interesting. So, and I guess the, the thing, the, the top level lesson there is take ownership of it. Like this is, you know, and that, which, which is a perfect way to illustrate that. And then, and then be a good steward of it and kind of uh, don't just take it, but but share it as well. Uh, is that, I guess, let me ask you about that. Like you've, you've taken ownership, you, you, you have that. I, and I love the, the kind of the attitude that you uh, imply and everything you say that like, take ownership, get out there, you know, be an improv artist as you sell this or, you know, however you do it. But um, how else, I guess, how, how else do you sell this to other folks? How, how, how else do you make those mid-level connections, bus silos, um, get those marketing and technical people talking to each other better and, and, and speaking that I think, and I think the most important thing might be that speaking the same language that you talked about earlier. Um, how do you align people around the language? Correct. I just wrote an article for the STC intercom magazine about soft skills that you need to be, to be successful as a tech com professional. And one of the first things I'm suggesting is take a class in accounting. Accounting. Wow. Well, don't forget anything that you sell to management, you have to specify in their terms, right? Um, you need to understand cash flow and uh, return on investment and is um, cost avoidance, um, risk management, all these things that management is uh, concerned about that they don't teach tech writers. I never took a class in risk avoidance. Um, so you need to be able to speak CEO or, or speak middle management in order to sell the idea that you've got a content strategy that if implemented will cost this much, but will generate this much revenue or this much goodwill. 
or um, here's a classic example. I'll keep it a short story. Back when we were first moving to online sales and um, Target had created their website, populated with all the things they sold, except they failed to populate the metadata that readers for people who are sight impaired, the screen readers will actually describe what's that product if they can't see it. They didn't populate that. And the checkout icon was this little tiny checkout in the upper right hand corner that me with my glasses on could barely see. So the American Civil Union asked them to, can you please populate the metadata? And they went, no. So they got sued under the American with Disabilities Act and went all the way to Supreme Court and they lost. And it cost them in over, I think, $120 million in um, court fees alone. Um, and they still lost. So I went, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Because somebody didn't want to spend, I don't know, $10,000 for a tech writer to populate the description metadata, you lost $120 million. You know, so this is where you have to say, what is the cost of doing nothing? You know, um, a very similar story, uh, an airline, not to be named, based out of Chicago, had signed a contract with the U.S. Postal Service saying, um, and the Postal Service said, you need to be able to, you know those little barcodes in the bottom of the mail? They wanted to scan each piece so they knew where it was in the system. And so the airline spent all this money on um, the barcode things, but no policies and procedures on how to do it. So they came to us wanting four tech writers with air traffic control experience to go into these airports and document this. And it failed because they couldn't get funding for it. So I waited and they said, we're gonna to cobble together some internal resources. So I called back and said, Bob, how'd that project go? And he goes, it failed miserably. And there was a clause saying, if you're not barcode compliant by May 1st, you still have to carry the mail. We just don't have to pay you. And it took them months to get this sorted out. And in fact, they lost $20 million in lost revenue. I went, wait a minute, are you telling me you lost $20 million in lost revenue because you didn't want to spend $20,000 on a tech writer or two? He goes, yeah, but you need to realize that we were in bankruptcy at the time and it's easier to explain away lost revenue than it is to get a PO approved. And my viewpoint on that was he did not build a good enough business case when he pitched this to his management. Right? Nice. Yep. No, that makes, that makes perfect sense that like, and so, and, and that kind of lines up you know, that, that whole um, little episode you just talked about kind of lines up too with the, the language stuff. If you can't actually get everybody aligned around the language that you're talking about, at least speak their language when you're right. with each individual you're interacting with. Hey, another thing I want to make sure, because I'm, I want to stay mindful of time and I want to make sure we get to this. Well, one thing we also have talked about, this is going way upstream because we're talking about people with jobs trying to do cool, fun stuff, but there's also further upstream as you're submitting submitting re resumes, there are these new evil, or maybe not evil, but troublesome applicant tracking systems that that um, that you've you've said a couple times in just other conversations we've had about how you see like really good candidates not get considered because they haven't kind of like, I guess it's like SEO, like you have to cater to the search engines in, in a job, you have to cater to the um, to these uh, ATSs. Um, can, tell me, tell me more about the details of that and how you can get around and how you can address it. The adjective I like to use is sinister. <laughs> nice. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, ATS is an applicant tracking system. In the old days, they were very benign and useful. It just was a way that employers or recruiters could tell where a candidate was in the interview process, right? It's a way for us to like, oh, I've got a tech writing job in, in Des Moines. Let me look at my database and find a tech writer in Des Moines. Well, with the advent of mobile, a lot of websites uh, like Monster and Indeed um, put this feature in that uh, either A, if you see a job you're interested in, just swipe and, and apply. Apply, 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 apply. Or worse, they set up bots saying, hey, anytime a technical writer job opens in Los Angeles, submit me for it. So suddenly companies are getting hundreds of resumes, 99.9% .9 of which were not qualified for that job. So rather than waste a human's time reading them all, they just put in an AI with some an artificial intelligence into their ATS that would automatically compare your resume to the job requirements. And if they didn't match, they would just automatically reject it. 
you know, human wouldn't even see it. They only see the top X percent. So like you said, in search engine optimization, you have to make sure that your resume matches the job description or the job requirements. Well, just to show you how insidious this is, a friend of mine was a UI UX developer, user interface user experience, UI UX developer, applying for a UI UX developer job and was getting rejected. And come to find out there are websites, if you just search, is my resume ATS friendly, you can post, paste in the job description you're interested in, paste in your resume, and that site will show whether or not you're a good match and where. So she did this and realized, I get this, she was a UI UX developer, had that in the first line of her resume, but the job she was applying for was a UX UI developer and she was a UI UX developer and the ATS said that doesn't match. Right? Mm -hmm. So my viewpoint has been for years, stop applying to job for jobs via applicant tracking systems. Use your personal network, right? Find somebody who works at John Deere Tractor and say, hey, if I give you my resume, will you pass it on? Because they make it a bonus for finding you, right? Maybe the documentation manager is on LinkedIn. If nothing else, the recruiter's on LinkedIn, right? Say, hey, I see there's an opening. I send you my resume. They may ignore you. They may say yes, or they may say, apply for the job by the website, but I'll keep an eye open for your resume. Well, look at that. You've got a set of eyes, human eyes, looking at where it can even pull you out of the junk bin if you get misrouted there. So that's my 10 seconds or less on how to avoid ATSs. How to, how to avoid the ATS. And that's, um, I guess, you know, one thing I want to go circle back to real quick. You mentioned a website where you can go and, and upload mm -hmm. a job description or link to it like a job description and upload your resume and it'll say how AT I, I would definitely love to link to that in the show notes. So if you can send me that, I'd, I'd appreciate sure. it. Yeah. Um, I know ziprecruiter.com does that, which is probably good if you're applying for a job via ziprecruiter. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. And, um, and, and that's, I, I and that kind of gets to, um, well, I guess, um, there's, that's kind of a binary, like you make it or you don't, or you make the cut or you don't, uh, are there incremental ways along the way that you can improve your odds of making the cut? Um, yeah, absolutely. Just, yeah. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, put aside that really pretty resume you've spent the past 10 years developing, um, for example, ATSs can't read icons. They can't read tables. They can't parse long sentences. For example, if the job requirement is experience writing policies and procedures, and you say in your resume, experience writing a variety of things for end users and corporations, including user manuals, uh, style guides, and policies and procedures, that an ATS would never parse that. So if, they, if the requirement is experience writing policies and procedures, you say experience writing policies and procedures. You really have to tailor your, tailor your resume for each job for which you're applying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's the, and, that's the, I got to say, that's the kind of thing that drives a lot of content people nuts, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're like, oh, great, I'm writing for a machine now. But it sounds like this isn't the most advanced artificial intelligence, if, you know, but 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 understanding that is super important if you want to get in the door and make your case. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just go ahead. One more thing I say, e even better than finding a human to apply for the job, be so visible in your industry that people come to you, companies find you, right? So you should be writing articles, doing blogs, like, you know, doing interviews like this, um, where if I search for, you know, documentation manager in Milwaukee, I already know Molly Barrett. I've met Molly Barrett at an STC conference or at LavaCon, my conference, all right? Um, so the, most jobs never get posted online because they know how much they're gonna get spammed. So they're going to work their network. You know, who do I know? So be visible. Have them ask you to go work for them, not the other way around. That way you don't even have to deal with an ATS. Yeah, I love that. That's the ultimate ATS hack is don't even put your put it in your way. Just work around it. That's great. Bravo. Yep, exactly. Yeah, cool. Are there other, um, you know, I think as we talk about AI and the ATS, are there other 
practices like that, like, and I, I think you're absolutely, I, I would agree a thousand percent that like working your personal network and developing your own sort of um, platform in the industry, you know, is, is a way to go. Um, are there other tips that you offer to your job candidates? Like, hey, if you really want to stand out, um, here's a couple more things you could do or? I am going to give you a real life story of something I actually did as an example of things you can do other than applying for a job through a website. I was working in Orange County as a technical writer, and I picked out the, the top 10 high tech companies in Orange County that I wanted to work for. And I called the documentation managers there and says, hi, I'm writing an article for my STC newsletter on trends in hiring in techcom and OC. May I interview you? Every single one of them said, sure. So I asked, what are you looking for? When are you hiring them? Right? What tools do you want? You know, by the end of this, I knew exactly who was hiring, when they were hiring, what they were looking for. And mind you, I did write the article. And, but then I asked the managers, would you like me to send you a copy of the article when it's done? Yes, please. What's your email address? Right? And then I said, by the way, my contract is going to be ending in about two months. Is it okay if I send you my resume? And they went, sure. And I'll tell you, I've never been unemployed in Orange County. Um, and I did write the article. It did get published. Um, but that's how I became first name basis with every single hiring manager in Orange County that I wanted to work for. And that that's is great. just a single example of something you can do or your audience could do. Yeah, and I think anybody can think of a, a way they could do that. Uh, yeah. Something like that, that they can, and we're all writers. I mean, that's a logical one, writing an article or something like that. Hey, Jack, we're, we're coming up close to time. I can't, these conversations always go so quickly, but I want to make sure, is there anything last, anything that's come up in the conversation or that's just on your mind that you want to make sure we get to before we wrap up? I was going to do this until you asked that it's interesting, especially as a contractor, they're going to want you to have the tools they're looking for um, right off the bat. They don't have time to train you on FrameMaker. And I have had people said, oh, I can learn FrameMaker in a weekend. And my, my answer is, well, then why haven't you? And uh, again, I'll give you a real life example. Um, I was applying for a contract that wanted conditional text in FrameMaker. It's like a variable. The Mazda 626 and Ford Probe are the exact same car. You just change the name. So... Um, so I got a copy of FrameMaker, taught it to myself, and then I, I put out a note to my STC buddies going, hey, if anyone wants to learn this, meet me at Starbucks with your laptop on Saturday. And I taught everybody how to do conditional text and then got the interview. And the manager said, can you do con um, conditional text in FrameMaker? And I went, do conditional text? I've taught conditional text in FrameMaker and got the job. And now granted, that might not work for everyone, but it worked for me. Um, but it's that concept of being proactive teach, lead a workshop, be visible. Um, I would end with that. That and I have a discount code for your followers. If, right. um, okay, tell. Um, so I produced the LavaCon Conference on Content Strategy, which is gonna be virtual this year. Um, it's gonna be in October. And uh, we've got speakers from Microsoft and Amazon and PayPal and NASA, it's just amazing. Um, so if any of your uh, listeners want to attend, Use the referral code team hashtag team Swanson for a hundred dollars off tuition and you can go to lavacon.org and find out more. Thanks so much, Jack. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes as well. And this episode should drop, I think, October 14th is my scheduled pub date. So that should, there'll Fine still be time. plenty of time to register for the conference. Well, thanks. Hey, and one very last thing, what's the best way for folks to stay in touch if they want to connect with you on social media or... LinkedIn. I am the only Jack Molasani on LinkedIn. It's kind of hard to find me. Uh, not hard to find me. Um, yeah, that's the best place. And then we could always make a connection from there. Sweet. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. Well, thanks so much, Jack. Great to talk to you again. Larry, always a pleasure. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.